Welcome back. Lee and I are back for part two of our great conversation on mushrooms, using them clinically in practice from a medicinal standpoint. We are not talking about psychedelics. We are yes. talking about medicinal mushrooms. So Lee, welcome back. Glad you're here. Thanks, Rhonda. Great to be back. So if you didn't catch last week's podcast episode, Lee and I talked about, well, Lee did most of the talking, which I'm happy about, but he shared about kind of the history of mushrooms, where they came from, like ancestrally, the paleo diet, pulling it all the way through to today. And then we talked about the importance of having that clinical knowledge to be able to use with your patients, whether you're using them as supplements, the mushrooms as supplements, or eating them in a cooked form, which we, Lee is recommending that we eat them in cooked form. We talked about types of mushrooms and how easy they are to get at the grocery store. So if you missed that one, go back and listen to that podcast. But today, what we are going to talk about is Lee's going to give us his five top mushroom picks for those of you that are thinking, oh, where do I start? I don't even know what to do. So he, we're going to talk about that. And then he's going to talk about some counterfeits and things to be aware of in the market. So Lee, I'm going to let you start where you want to start with this conversation. So take it away. Thank you. So five top mushrooms. When I got into mushrooms and in my 20 years of industry experience as a manufacturer and educator and practitioner within herbal medicine, mushrooms had this, were pigeonholed as this immune modulator thing that maybe weren't as good as herbs, but you use them in cancer. And that, that was kind of the extent of my understanding. But now I know that the beta glucans in mushrooms are a language that communicates with our immune system and it keeps it in tip top shape. So when we consume mushrooms regularly, our immune system is more capable, it's more vigilant, it's more accurate, it's able to mount the exact appropriate defense and not be underperforming or overperforming. And all of that coalesces together into clearly less chance of having flus and coughs and colds and that sort of stuff, but you get less cancer. So your body's more capable of getting rid of the neoplastic cells as they form. But every tissue in our body's got resident macrophages. So this language that we get when we consume the beta glucans of mushrooms means that all of our macrophage communities are all healthy. So that means we've right. got healthy tissue. So at a very deep level, the regular consumption of a mushroom is gonna do that. So the first mushroom on my list, or the first group of mushrooms on my list, because it doesn't just have to be one in this category, is having a mushroom as a regular part of your diet, which looks after your immune system. When you've got to narrow it down, I think shiitake's right up there, but you, many companies have combinations which kind of fit this category. Yeah. So you can co combine shiitake and reishi and maitake, you put a bit of chaga in. So however that kind of plays out, that immune thing needs to be top of the pile. And clearly I'll, my Mediherb heritage, and this is kind of a bit heretical for me to say this, particularly in public. <laughs> That's okay. There are lots of changes happening right now. So we're all friendly around here. You go. So I don't use as much echinacea as I used to in clinic. Ah. And Mush mushrooms have taken over that immune support that I get used to get from echinacea. Oh, and wow. I now use echinacea much more judiciously and I use it where there's threatening infections. I use it in some active diseases and then I use it as a defense against getting ill. So acute doses when people are in the early stages of an illness, but it still plays a really important role in my clinic. But it doesn't play that every patient, every time kind of role that it used to, because it's so, expensive. Yeah. And can I yeah. ask you a question then? We, for those of us that love and use Mediherb, we would always use Echinacea as that immune modulator, right? We were yeah. taught yeah. that it modulates, so it will slow down an overactive immune response and it will upregulate an underperforming immune response. Yeah. That being said, then, if you are using Echinacea more acutely, would you say that in the case of, let's say, an autoimmune condition where we have a hyperactive response of the immune system for whatever reason, whatever's triggering it, yeah. but it, with that hyperactive response, would you say that mushrooms take that role and can perform that same type function? Or are we now, do we need to think about it differently? Yeah, I think in my learning and my own kind of practice, 
I'm not at the point yet where I can be really conclusive about answering that. Mm. So I still use echinacea in all my autoimmune cases. Okay. Um, but I am including mushrooms as well right. where it's relevant. So mushrooms so are the immune to tell. It may be hard yeah. to tell. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't have a big clinic, so it takes a bit longer to get the volume to get the feedback. So right. I still I'm using mushrooms in autoimmune diseases and there's a bit of a fear that mushrooms are immunostimulating, but they're not in the same way that Echinacea is not immunostimulating. So right. I think that's a special category and I probably still use both. Okay. Having said that, you know, I, I am not using echinacea in every autoimmune case. Yeah. So interesting. I got this is because I deal with so many autoimmune cases. So that's why it was a, a special interest to me. So I'm going to be thinking about this and obviously trying to extract some of that information as I work through your course. Yeah. So, okay. So your number one is some mushrooms for immune shiitake being the king or yeah. right up there close to the top. And so if there was an immune combination product what would you do if someone did not want to eat mushrooms because there are mushroom haters out there they don't yeah. like the squeak they don't like the feel they don't like the thing yeah don't like the taste either uh -uh. Yeah. so we'll get to quality at the end but it's a very challenging marketplace to get an effective and an authentic product so I'm not affiliated with any companies now, so I, I'm kind of free to talk about whoever I, you know, has got a good product. So Real Mushrooms is an excellent brand and they have retail products, but they offer practitioners a discount, which, nice. makes, it very, which makes it very attractive. And those yeah. products are as authentic and as good as you can get. They're, they're as, they represent exactly how nature intended you to consume your mushrooms. Mm. So, they have a product called Five Defenders, but they also have a shiitake product. So e either of those. And in the year after I stopped working with Mediherb, I developed a range of products for a company called Third Planet, which is distributed by Aduco. So they have a product called MycoRev Immune, which is shiitake and uh, reishi and maitake, which s serves that kind of purpose of immune kind of support and immune strengthening and immune education and immune insurance. So two options then, as far as supplementing with those for the immune yeah. system, otherwise shiitake dietarily. Yeah. Just once, eating yeah. 200 grand or well, 20. So four ounces of shiitake a week kind of is the maintenance kind of dose. So you could okay. just, you don't have to do them every day. You just have to do that twice a week. Yeah. I have a proper meal of shiitakes and it's done. That's amazing. I and mean, the, it really, really is amazing. Yeah. You live longer, you have less cognitive decline, you have better cognitive health, you have less Alzheimer's, you have less cancer of all types, you have less metabolic disease, the less depressed. The list is really long just from eating mushrooms as part of your diet. Wow. So for on the cognitive decline, I imagine that one of your top five is going to have something to do with cognitive decline. Yes. Yeah. So Lion's Mane is, that one. is really popular at the moment. And if we were going to go with evidence, the, there's not a huge amount of evidence for Lion's Mane. There's a lot of hype and there's a lot of, there's a lot of interest in it. So I'm, I'm combining Lion's Mane with my herbs that I know work. So I'm combining Lion's Mane with, with ginkgo and bacopa and yeah, right. Th those sorts of things go to cola and I'm focusing on microcirculation, but lion's mane is an amazing mushroom. It's a, it's one of the choice edible mushrooms. It's really beautiful to eat and in higher doses, it has profound gastrointestinal benefits. It's a fantastic prebiotic and it helps resolve ulcerations and, and inflammation in the gut. Really? So and much think, like a, it would be like a slippery elm type effect. Yeah. It's like a slippery elm. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. a mushroom form of slippery elm. Yeah. And I think quite a bit of the cognitive stuff comes from that gut brain axis. Oh, but interesting. Lion's mane is a bit like a medicinal mushroom in that it contains lots of secondary metabolites. So it's a real secondary metabolite factory and it's really quite complex. So there's these molecules called hericerins and the most commonly known group of those are called hericinones and then there's erinacines and these molecules cross the blood brain barrier and they have the capacity to interact with with receptors in the brain 
and they can increase nerve growth factor and brain derived neurotrophic factor yeah. and perform the role of like housekeeping, if you like, within the brain. The beta glucans and all of the curious immune acting molecules, they're helping to calm down overactive glial cells. So the microglial cells that get inflamed and perpetuate these types of conditions, right. they can be calmed down from the immunological aspect of that. The, I go into some detail in that in my course, but the, when you consume beta glucans, they get trafficked by dendritic cells into bone marrow. And, and lymph nodes and spleen and thymus and the ones in the bone marrow, there's channels that, that are available in the choroid plexus. So these molecules actually can get into the brain where they have a wow. calming effect. So lion's mane, that we need more research and, but it is looking like it's gonna, it is the real deal. The, the early clinical trials, patients that took five grams of lion's mane a day for four months, they had steady improvements in their many mini mental state exam scores. And then when they stopped taking the lion's mane, their cognitive function started to slowly decline again. So lion's mane is like a nutrient that when you consume it, it help keeps your brain functioning optimally. Well, so that's, yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. Like for, if you had a patient that was starting to maybe exhibit some early signs of just cognitive decline due to just aging, right? Yeah. What, so what I'm hearing you say is that using something, taking lion's mane as a supplement, because it's, I've never seen it in the grocery store. You probably find it somewhere, but I've never seen it like at the regular grocery store. So if we supplemented with that, then that, does it reverse any of that age related decline or is it just maintaining it and improving it as long as you're taking it, as you mentioned? Well, I think it'll have a preventative role. Yeah because mush mushrooms have a preventative role period. So that's from their beta glucan. So these molecules in lion's mane will have a preventative role, but then once the disease processes start to kick in, this is where you need to include the other, the, the, know, the, other, part, the other bits of the yeah. program. So yeah. Yeah. I think it'd be inappropriate just to use lion's mane on its own, right. but in concert with those other things, and you get it early enough, I think it will help. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. there's nothing wrong with it being a nutrient. Like you can't eat all the food that you want to eat just in one month and starve yourself for the rest of the year. Right. Like, yeah. Right. So right. there are certain habits that we need to engage in. And when we engage with them long term, we reap the benefits. So mushrooms are in that category where they should be habits like exercise. You can't do all the exercise for the year just in one week and then take the rest of the year off. You've got to do some every consistency every, yeah. every week. Yeah. So yeah. the you know, mushrooms fit into that category, like green tea and you know, like all the polyphenols from all the vegetables that right. we consume. The they're regular parts of our routine, the olive oil. So lion's mane fits into that category beautifully. So number one is on the Mushroom side is going to be something for immune. Number two is brain with lion's mane. What's number three? Yeah, well, there's a bunch of places we can go. So the prebiotic potential of mushrooms is huge and every mushroom has it. So it doesn't have to be an, its own category. So each one of the mushrooms I'm talking about, put in your head, it's a prebiotic and it works as well as slippery elm and any of those other ones. So I think the Maybe third would be vitality and energy. So with something like cordyceps, so yeah. cordyceps yeah. militaris in the US has got the reputation for that. So cordyceps is a really curious fungus. It's, a, it's different to any of the other ones. It's a different, different class of fungus. And it's been popularized by The Last of Us, that show on HBO. Yeah, where it, yeah. Because it parasitizes insects and arthropods and that sort of thing. It can't infect humans. I think the, uh, the cordyceps species are getting together and having a class action lawsuit <laughs> drawn up against <laughs> HBO for defamation. <laughs> so cordyceps improves the HPA axis. It improves mitochondrial energy production. It improves lung health so it improves the way that we convert oxygen into energy so that interface in the lung 
is enhanced. So there's a very strong lung involvement with cordyceps and there's a very strong kidney involvement. So all of the metabolic waste that's water soluble coming from the lungs needs to exit for, through the kidney. So that connection is really quite strong. So I use cordyceps in lung diseases and kidney diseases. I use it as the tonic in acute respiratory conditions. So mm -hmm. someone's got a cough or a cold or they've got COVID, cordyceps is in there to just to generally support the lungs and improve your vitality so that when they emerge from the illness, they're not as devitalized. Right. And then I use it along with rhodiola and schizandra for supporting the facilitation and adaptation against stressful settings. So sporting endeavors and busy schedules and like busy lifestyles. Right. Cordyceps are very gentle, gentle kind of adaptogenic tonic kind of vibe in that type of setting. So I get good results with com combining it with rhodiola. So typically rhodiola gets combined with Korean ginseng or schizandra. They're, right. they're kind of like the two main ones, but right, right. rhodiola Would you say five grams of the cordyceps? Yeah, around three a day is probably enough. Three to get good results with many of these mushrooms having more is a little bit better so there's some quite wide dosage ranges yeah do you have a general if you were talking about like real mushrooms for instance you're equating them quality wise with the quality that we've all come to know and appreciate from the Mediherb side so if you're kind of making Definitely. that parallel equation as far yeah. as quality goes we know that on the Mediherb side we have a general dosing range that we can follow. You've got yeah. the maintenance all the way up to a little bit higher dose therapeutic, and then you have the really high dose, right? That we could use. Yeah, Do you yeah. have that kind of range in general that you would use for real mushrooms? Yeah, I've, that's all elaborated in my course and, I, and oh, in the monograph. So I use maintenance, therapeutic, and then extreme acute. So not every patient that's using these extreme doses is unwell people like me are kind of pushing the envelope of wellness so that's in the extreme category so yeah the cordyceps uh, say two grams up to 10 or 20 even 30 grams a day is quite fine yeah, yeah. just depends on the situation then and also cost because then, and then obviously cost, yeah. the more that you're taking then the more the cost is going to be yeah. but compared to an herbal product that we might use, the mushrooms are going to come in being much more economical, I'm sure. Mostly. Yeah. yeah. And I've met the people from Real Mushrooms and the parent company, Namex, which makes the extracts, has got the same philosophy as Mediherb. They've got the same kind of origins and the products are made in a way that gives them that superior edge. Yeah. It's it's quite a unique organization. And yeah. I love that because, well, for all of us and those that are listening, we're going to be, we're, the commitment we have is to make sure that what we give, we know we're going to get a good therapeutic outcome that you can yeah. count on the therapeutic outcome every single time. It doesn't vary yeah. batch to batch to batch. It's not one month. It's going to be working. And another month is not going to be working that every single time that we can count on the therapeutic end result. So, okay. Yeah. Cordyceps yeah. number three, what's number four? Number four. Just to give you a broad spectrum of possibilities, I'd put tremella in as number four. I love tremella. Tremella is an amazing mushroom. I cook with it a lot, but again, Real Mushrooms has got great products. And Third Planet, I, I created a, a tremella olive oil polyphenol product for them recently that's just launched in, in February for skin health. So tremella is noted for its, its skin benefits. So all skin diseases, it's kind of like Botox in a bottle. We yeah. used to say that about go to cola, but it helps improve skin quality. So even if you have no skin disease or skin blemishes, it improves the, the moisture holding capacity of collagen. It helps to slow down the breakdown of elastin, which just naturally happens as we age. So right. skin has less wrinkles and it's firmer and it has a nicer tone. It has a greater glowing complexion. So it used to be used for beauty traditionally, but all of the skin diseases benefit from tremella. Even psoriasis, and, eczema, urticaria, yeah, all of it. All of it. Yeah. So long-term use of tremella along with 
the relevant herbal program in each of those diseases you meant, mentioned starts to affect a long-term cure that can create a situation where that patient is free of that disease. Oh my gosh. And awesome. like the lion's mane, it's got a strong gut brain axis. It's got a strong gut skin axis. It's got a strong gut liver axis. So it does all of those other things as well. Wow. And the, there's in China, they're very advanced in their use of mushrooms and they've like we do with herbs, like with ginkgo, you use a 50 to one extract. So in China, they make a 50 to one tremella extract. And that extract is used in cancer treatment where people have low white blood, white blood cell counts. Mm. They use it in, in situations where people have hepatitis or chronic liver diseases, and it's used in dementia. So there's a clinical trial that was published in 2018. And over, over a period of eight weeks, Tremella, and they did very sophisticated MRI scanning of the brain as well as cognitive testing. And they observed significant increases in the size of the gray matter of the brain in multiple brain regions. Wow. And the one area that they studied cognitively was executive function that matched up with the part of the brain that controls executive function. So there was a, a wow. statistically significant relationship between those two things. So Tremel is an, am an amazing brain herb as well. And it's a super prebiotic. It's like slippery elm on steroids. So nice. For me, that's become like a, a daily thing. People should have a little bit of slippery, a, a little bit of tremella. tremella like I used to recommend slippery elm on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. If it's slippery yeah. elm on steroids, why would we not want to do that? Yeah. Well, uh, complexity is the key with all those fibers, but the there aren't any mushroom prebiotics out there. The uh, hydrolyzed guar gum is as kind of the, the yeah. most popular but it's yeah. the complexity of the fibers and tremella has got fibers that have got very potent hydrocolloid properties so they absorb a lot of water so when you mix it in water it goes very gooey mm -hmm. and that is very demulcent internally it's very emollient topically and it's part of me it's part of its part of its secret yeah it's it's really amazing and it well, looks you... a bit like a brain yeah when you and you think about like aloe, it's got that like slimy-ish. It's, it's, it's the same chemical thing. class. So mm -hmm. aloe is glucomannans and um, the tremella polysaccharides are mannan based as well. So aloe right. and mannan are kind of like close cousins. Yeah. They could yeah. even be brothers and sisters. Yeah. So what about number five? Number five, I would take a pick and go with ergotheanine, which is a, a nutrient in that all mushrooms have some in higher levels than others. And it's one of one of the fungal world's kind of secret weapon and ergotheanine. I like to say it's the most important nutrient you've never heard about. And ergotheanine is a modified amino acid and fungi are the only things that make it in significant quantities. And really? humans have have a need for it. We have transporter proteins that are pretty much exclusive just for that molecule. So we wouldn't have transporter proteins in our small intestine to bring that molecule in if our body didn't want it. Exactly. And then, or if it wasn't available in nature in the food that we ate. Yeah. So yeah. there's a clear need for it. And then all of the cells in our body have got the ability to bring this molecule in. And then in our kidney, we've got these same transporters, so we don't ever excrete any. So if we only lose 4% of what we consume. Like if you take vitamin B, you lose all of it within minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, you can mm -hmm. see it visibly, mm -hmm. you know. The... Mm -hmm. Yep. So this molecule is tenaciously retained in the body and its role in the body is as a, 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 a highly specific antioxidant molecule. And it engages where tissues are stressed and glutathione levels are depleted. So depending on the tissue in the body, glutathione levels can go up and down quite dramatically. Right. So ergotheanine is the backup part of the antioxidant team that mm. steps in to maintain the environment while the glutathione is regenerating. That's the, kind of like the easiest way to describe it. And then wow. there's some tissues in the body that are constantly under extreme stress. And 
the glutathione doesn't work. So like in the lens of the eye, where there's lots of UV, there's lots of oxygen, mm -hmm. ergotheanine's the main antioxidant in the lens and the retina of the eye, for example. When large population studies are done, the, Amer the American population is about four times less than they need for ergotheanine compared to other countries. So when you look at large population data, Italy has 4.4 milligrams per per day of intake and America has 1.1 milligrams. Yeah, I was just going to ask, like if they're so rich in the eye, if the ergothionine receptors are so rich in the eyes, then what, if we need that, where else are we getting it? Is it in plants? You know, it needs to come from mushrooms, but some uh, plants get a little bit from the fungi in the soil. Yeah. But there's a 10 or 10 to 100 times less ergothionine in plants than there is in mushrooms. So we need to wow. get it from mushrooms. That's where we need to get wow. it. And if you lack ergothionine, you'll have more cardiovascular disease and you'll have more neurodegenerative disease. So you'll have more cognitive decline. You'll have more Alzheimer's, you'll have more Parkinson's disease. And there's a, you won't sleep as well. They'll, your pregnancies won't be as healthy if you're a woman. There's an enormous amount of data pointing to wow. the key importance of ergotheanine. It's been known about for a very long time but we currently lack human clinical trials. It hasn't really had the spotlight on it. So I'm introducing it at a point in, the, in its life cycle, which is like where Mediherb introduced resveratrol, for example. So resveratrol was basically an unknown molecule. NRF2 was basically an unknown pathway. Yeah. And then we started talking about it. Kerry introduced the ideas. And then a few years later, it sort of t has taken off. Well, ergotheanine is that important and I'm on a mission to get everybody to know about it. So that's my fifth mushroom is we need to be consuming mushrooms regularly to get that level of ergotheanine. Right. Yeah. So now, okay, I, I have to say this is not planned, but I, my brain is full right now. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm very full. And if you're listening, you're probably thinking, oh my gosh, rewind, rewind, rewind. <sighs> so you can always listen to the podcast again, but Lee, I have a question yeah. for you now. You just like dropped a thousand nuggets of great information in there. What I really want to do, I want to make sure we have adequate time to talk about imposters and oh, talk yeah. about quality. Would you mind if we hit the pause button and we made this a part three? No, fine. That's good. For oh, me. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. listen, I'm literally putting Lee on the spot right now. We have not <laughs> talked about this. But I want to make sure that you all have time to really digest this information because then Lee just agreed whether I put him on the spot or not. But now he said yes. So he's committed. So oh, I'm, let's do it. Yeah, okay. it's exciting. I'm I'm energized by okay. this. Okay. Yeah. So what we're gonna do is again, we're gonna I'm gonna hit the pause button, let you all wrap up this part two, and we're gonna do an impromptu now, part three, which will come next week. And we're going to talk about, there's just so much good information here, Carrie. I mean, Carrie, talking about Medierb. <laughs> Lee, I can't thank you enough. I'm so grateful for you. And this next week, we're going to talk about, get to the good stuff, which is where do we find the good products. We've talked about that with real mushrooms, but I think just as relevant is talking about what to look for and imposters in the marketplace. So more talk on mushrooms with Lee Carroll coming up in our impromptu part three. So hang on. We'll be back next week. Thanks, Lee. See you. Bye-bye.